it's Laura with Rain Tree Nursery. And we are here today with Patricia and Linda and Wendy from pollinatorpathwaynorthwest.org. This is an amazing project. Patricia, tell us about it. Well, Laura, welcome to the pollinator garden here on 21 acres. Uh, we are demonstrating a gardens that are particularly wonderful for pollinators. And pollinators are bugs that pass pollen back and forth from plants and also fruiting trees, right? Right. Yeah. Bugs, bats, birds. Moths. Moths. Right. Ants. More than just bees. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Now, Linda, how old is this beautiful garden? So about two and a half, three years old. Wow. And um, we've spent a lot of time Kind of picking the right plants and moving them around and weeding and building and yeah yeah so so what you see behind us is what what's grown yeah over that time and wendy what is special about the plants that go in a pollinator garden all the plants here in our garden are beneficial to pollinators we've made sure that the soil is healthy and the plants are also healthy for the pollinators and do you select plants that give a lot of pollen? I mean, is that part of the selection process? Part of the part of the selection process, yes, definitely. We also try to get natives because our pollinators around us are native to the area as well as the plants in this garden. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Oh, that's great. So adding, mixing native plants and ornamental plants so that you get a lovely luscious look but you also have plants that the soil biology and the native pollinators recognize. Correct. Oh, this is so gorgeous. Will you show us around? Absolutely. Thank you. So Laura, I want to tell you that we are all amateur gardeners that are just passionate about gardening and about pollinators. And we're learning a tremendous amount as we do this project. One of the things that we've learned is that what plants you put in are really important. Natives, of course, but when you also buy those colorful plants that you pop in there for the way the garden looks. You need to be careful where you're getting them because often the big box stores and some of the bigger nurseries as well will sell plants that are saturated with systemic um, pesticides and they're killing the bees that you're attracting, attracting to your garden. Absolutely. That is a huge change in thinking that it's not just about adding flowers you really need to be careful about where you're sourcing those plants to make sure that, yeah, you're not introducing pesticides at the same time. So Wendy, tell us what is a pollinator garden? Okay, so a pollinator garden is a garden specifically for pollinators. Mm -hmm. We have all kinds of plants and various, various pollinators like various kinds of plants. And so we need to make sure that there's a variety for all of the pollinators. Another thing that pollinator gardens are not is actually one of those gardens where everything is perfect, perfectly lined out and pristine and lots of bright colors and so forth. Those are more appealing to us, but they're not so appealing to pollinators. What they're really after is something a little more messy, like what's behind us. Um, we don't have to keep them quite so, so pristine. They don't care. In fact, they'd rather it be messy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's actually less work for more benefit. That is so true. It really is a lot less work. <laughs> yeah. And, and so when we're talking about pollinators, we're talking about bees and moths mm -hmm. and what else? Butterflies, oh, yeah. beetles, um, bats even in certain areas of the country, apparently not in the Northwest, but in other parts, yes. So uh, birds, even reptiles can be, can be pollinators. So beautiful, flowery, and Lots of life. Correct. Life. Yes. Yeah. So Linda, tell us, what do you think is a critical component of a pollinator garden? Well, I think that it habitat is critical and um, diverse habitat is essential. So that we have in, in this garden, we have put um, different plants that grow throughout from spring to through fall mm -hmm. and even winter access to um, for pollinators, a variety of pollinators can mm -hmm. have access to the food they need. And that enables us to have the food that we eat. Exactly. So, um, so that's good. 
So it blooms from the earliest spring mm -hmm. all the way through the summer and then into fall. fall. Into fall. Which and can be hard to manage. can be hard. Yeah. yeah. And we still have shelter spaces and, play, and nesting spaces. So that's oh, really yeah. important. And so many, there's a lot of pollinators that are in the ground. I mean, that's where they nest. And so being messy is also another critical part of having yeah. a, a thriving or a robust pollinator garden. I have garden. heard that, that pollinator gardens, you don't want to clean up too much. Nope. You want to yeah. allow the seed heads to stay. Absolutely. You want to allow the, the litter to stay on the ground so that all of the parts of that beautiful web have places to spend the winter, right? Absolutely. Nice. That's right. Yeah, it's hard to be messy, but it's good for the planet. So tell me about the pathway part of pollinator pathways. Okay, so that's a great question because often people think that it has to be a complete contiguous corridor that, you know, is just goes through a town or, or a city or whatever. But basically it's, it is um, different, like a stepping stones mm. or oasis is a good word too, where the pollinators will find the food sources they need in a way that allows them to thrive. Mm -hmm. And so across an urban area, like we're on the outskirts of a, a urban area with a lot of development. Yeah. And so um, our goal is to educate people that they don't have to do a lot, but if home gardens were um, spread across our community and, and easily accessed. And if that even went to a balconies in the newly constructed kind of high rises that we have here mm -hmm. um, and around businesses, then all the pollinators would be able to um, get the nutrients they need and do the work that they're designed to do in, uh, in our food, in the, in the food chain. Yes. Yeah. So, Because yes. I know right across the street from us here are condominiums. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. there's also fruit trees and bushes that are here and so I can just see all those pollinators going from spot to spot to spot and then finding oh here's a fruit tree here yeah. and, oh here's a blueberry bush over exactly. here and that's how it gets done in the city right yeah. in fact you know one of the things that we did was talk to someone who was involved in that whole complex this uh, condominiums townhouses you know it's it, it really is an urban area and we talked about well how how do you manage these plants that you have? They're beautiful. And um, there was a lot of discussion about that. Do you use pesticides? Mm -hmm. And we certainly don't want to attract pollinators to a garden that is unhealthy for them. And it, yeah. it, it's difficult, even in neighborhoods. Um, right. So um, it really is about educating everybody about this new paradigm that we're all responsible for for taking care of these species. Yeah, yeah. different way of thinking. You were yeah. telling me that they're that there's actually somebody in your group that's working with an HOA yes, to get yes. some pollinator gardens approved with approved plants yep, and, and no pesticides and oh absolutely they're doing that across the country too you can kind of you know we do a lot of google searches and try to see who's doing like work and um, so that's inspirational to us and the same person she is where she and her husband are working on um, all that property under the power lines so yeah. could that be just wildflowers or wild meadows? And so that's kind of an exciting thing. So those conversations are going on too. So creative. So Wendy, tell us a little bit about, there's an organization called Pollinator Pathway? Yeah, that's correct. So, so the term Pollinator Pathway was actually coined by Sarah Bergman. I have no idea how many years ago, 10, okay. 15, even, even more possibly. And she started that here in Seattle quite a while ago. She ended up leaving Seattle area and she lives up at the, well, I think she lives in the Northeast. But another organization took that on called pollinatorpathway.org um, and they're up in the Northeast of the United States. Mm -hmm. When we got together and decided that we wanted to become an organization, we found them and we decided to uh, loosely be associated with them as well. And our organization, of course, is Pollinator Pathway Northwest. Oh, okay. And so folks can look at either organization's website and find out if there are local chapters or even start maybe their own local chapter? If they, yes, if they want to start their own, own local chapter, they should go to pollinatorpathway.org uh -huh. because that you can see where the, where the chapters already are. Uh -huh. And if there isn't anything, they can start one of their own in their area. Wow, exciting. Yeah, yeah it's great. And it's always so nice to have something, a template, Mm -hmm. to start with, 
so that people don't feel like they're making something up out of whole cloth. They, I'm sure, have lots of information online. They do, and, and actually, all the different organizations, they are not, it's not an overarching organization. Mm -hmm. We're all just loosely associated, associated, and we do whatever we want to do in our area, what makes sense for our area. Right, because native plants are going to change depending on which regions you're in. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good to remember. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <sighs> I am so inspired. Thank you so much for sharing this fantastic project with us. Wendy, and Linda, and Patricia, thanks for joining us at 21 Acres here in Woodenville, Washington from Rain Tree Nursery. We will see you next time.